Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today's topic is infinite strategy spaces. I cover this in Lesson 4.1 of Game Theory 101, The Complete Textbook. Now, I know I might have said in the previous lecture that this would be the final lecture of this course, and while that was true originally, every summer I go through the textbook and make some edits, and over this summer I decided to add an entire new lesson, and so the few lessons that I'm going to be adding to this lecture series will be covering what I cover in Lesson 4.1, and that just happens to be what you see here on your screen. We're covering infinite strategy spaces here. So to give you an idea of what's going on, and we're going to be covering this in a couple more lectures as well, every game that we've looked at so far has had a finite number of pure strategies. And that's made things really easy because a finite number of strategies is much simpler than an infinite number of strategies simply because there's fewer of them. However, the reality of things is that some games have an infinite number of pure strategies, and so it would be good for you if you had some sort of idea about how to go about tackling these sorts of games. And the reason that you need a little bit of an idea about how to do this is because the methods that we seen on how to solve simultaneous move games before don't really work on the infinite strategy spaces. So the couple of big problems, the first big problem is that you can't even draw a matrix for an infinite strategy space, right? You don't have enough paper in the world to draw that all out when there's an infinite number of strategies that a player can pick. Now it's important to note that games define a matrix, not the other way around. So it's not the case that a matrix is a game. A matrix is just a representation of a game. Now, these representations are very useful. If you remember way back to our first lecture on the prisoner's dilemma, I think I had two slides full of writing about what the situation of the prisoner's dilemma was, and we could condense all of that information on those two slides into a simple two by two game matrix. And that makes things much easier to solve and it's much more user friendly. However, that itself is not the game. The game is what was written on those two slides. And so even without a matrix, you still are a game. A game is just a, a set of strategies, some timing, some players, and some payoffs. That's all it is. But we can't draw these things out when we're looking at infinite strategy spaces. Another issue with infinite strategy spaces is this problem with Nash's theorem. Infinite Games with infinite strategy spaces may or may not have Nash equilibria. If you remember back to what Nash's theorem said, Nash's theorem said that all finite games have at least one Nash equilibrium, where finite games is referring to the number of players and the number of strategies. Well, that's great for when we have a finite number of strategies here, but as it turns out, when we're looking at this lesson, we're talking about infinite strategy spaces. So Nash's theorem tells us nothing about that. So games may or may not have equilibria, when we're looking at infinite strategy spaces. So that's new and that's neat. And in fact, in this lecture, I wanna give you a specific example of a game that doesn't have any equilibria before we go. And that example looks like this. Here's the game. Player one chooses some number X greater than zero, strictly greater than zero, it cannot be zero. And player two chooses Y greater than zero. Again, any number that's strictly greater than zero. The payoffs that the players get are the product of those two numbers, X times Y. Now, this game has no equilibria, and it's very easy to see this. All we need to do here is to show that there are no mutual best responses, right? Uh, Nash equilibrium is a pair of mutual best responses for a two-player game, and so if we can show that no pairs of strategies are mutual best responses, then we're good to go. And we can actually do this by just looking at one player here. So remember here that both players pay off are x and y. Can player one play any value for x in equilibrium? Is there any x value that represents an equilibrium? Well, no, that can't be the case because x plus one is a profitable deviation. So give me any strategy for player one, any value for x, that can only be played in equilibrium if there aren't any profitable deviations, if player one can't change his strategy and do better. Well, x plus 1 is going to do better because x plus 1 times y is greater than x times y. So as a result, player 1 never has a best response. There are no best responses for player 1 for any strategy that player 2 has. And as long as player 1 doesn't have any best responses, then there can't be any mutual best responses. So we don't even have to look through player y or player 2's decision for y to see about her best responses because they don't matter. As long as player 1 doesn't have any best responses, then there can't be any Nash equilibria. Of course, if we really wanted to, it would be pretty easy to show show that the same logic applies to player two and player two doesn't have any best responses either. Well, that's that. That is a game that doesn't have any equilibria, but most of these games that you'll be playing with with the infinite strategy spaces will have equilibria, and we'll look at a couple of very important ones in the next couple of lectures, the median voter theorem and second price auctions. So I hope you enjoy this, and I hope you enjoy these bonus couple of videos that we're going to be talking about uh, in, in the next few lectures. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time. Take care.